Hi, everybody. My name is Carl Darden, and I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for joining us today here on Navy Sports Central. I am your host, and this is the official podcast of the Navy Sports Nation, where we take a deeper dive into Navy sports. In this episode, we'll be getting you up to speed on a couple of sports set to kick off the fall season already, and we'll also be joined by a Navy coach who's coming off an extremely successful season. He'll be here to discuss what that was like, as well as what the expectations are for this year. So stick with us, and we'll be right back. Okay, we are back, and we appreciate you being with us. Whether you are a returning listener or you're checking us out for the first time, thanks for making us part of your day. Uh, Before we get to our guests, I did want to update you on a couple of Navy teams, including one that got their season underway just this past Thursday. Uh, The women's soccer team got off to a great start with an exciting win at home. They hosted Loyola Marymount University and came away with a 2-1 win. Uh, The two goals were scored by Kelly Tatum in the seventh minute of the game, and then Caitlin Doran... Uh, came through with one four minutes into the second half. That one broke a one-to-one tie to give Navy the win. Tatum, who is a freshman, scored her goal on a header coming off of a corner kick, and Duran uh, got hers by stealing the ball from the Lions goalkeeper and putting it into the open net. So the mids put one in the win column, their very first time out, which is um, always a good thing. Staying with soccer, the men's team will be hosting Drexel in an exhibition match later today. Uh, They were actually supposed to play Virginia last weekend, but that got canceled due to weather. Uh, And then on Tuesday, the Mids did take on James Madison in another exhibition. The Dukes are ranked 21st in the nation, and they did come out on top by a 2-1 score in that one. But hopefully the Mids uh, can build on that result as they get ready for their opener against UMBC on Thursday. And one more update for you, and this is uh, regarding the football team. As most of you know, the Mids will be taking on Marshall at home on September the 4th in their first game of the season. By all accounts, the Mids have been going at it hard so that they'll be ready on game day. Uh, The quarterback competition is still pretty tight. Uh, Ty Levitai and Xavier Arline are in a dead heat for the starting job, and Masai Maynard is right on their heels. So we should know how things shake out here pretty soon. Okay, that gets you caught up to speed on three of our teams. And now we'll be joined by a very special guest to get his thoughts on the great finish his team had last season, as well as his expectations for this year. Our guest today has been leading the Navy lightweight rowing program since 2013. Uh, Prior to that, he was an assistant coach at Syracuse University. While in college, he rowed competitively at Washington State University, where he served as team captain and earned all Pac-10 conference honors in 1998. He began his coaching career at Washington State with a club rowing program right after graduating before moving on to become the freshman coach at Gonzaga University. In 2011, he began working as an assistant coach with the U23 U.S. Women's National Team while also taking an assistant coach position at Syracuse. In 2012, two of his members from his freshman boat from the previous year helped the Orange achieve a fifth-place finish at the Intercollegiate Racing Association Championships, and that was their best finish in 22 years. Since coming to Navy eight years ago, our guest has had multiple crews qualify for the IRAs. They won their first individual boat title under him in 2017 with the uh, Varsity Fours. And in 2018, the team came in third at the IRAs and finished the season ranked fifth in the nation. The following year, the Mids V8 crew won a bronze medal at the Eastern Sprints and finished tied for second at the IRAs while winning two individual boat titles as well. And this past spring, the Navy lightweight team battled through a season disrupted by the pandemic to win the national championship at the IRAs, which was their first one since 2004. So I am very happy to have head coach of the national champion Navy lightweight rowing team, Sean Bagnall, join us today. Uh, Coach, thank you so much for being with us. Ah, Carl, thank you so much for the opportunity. No problem at all. So we just got a little thumbnail sketch of your coaching history, but I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail regarding how you came to hear about the coaching position at Navy and what about it appealed to you the most. Yeah, the uh, the rowing world's kind of a, a, a small world. So, uh, you know, having cross recruited with Navy a lot uh, with Syracuse, actually, we we have a, a, a long standing cup race with Syracuse Cornell and, and Navy on the heavyweight side. So obviously I had been to Annapolis with the Syracuse team. I had met, you know, Coach Clothier had known him, uh, you know, through his years uh, at the academy. But uh, more importantly was his assistant coach, Rob Friedrich, who was the lightweight uh, head coach and had won uh, the last national championship in 2004. He came on to the heavyweight side um, as their assistant coach. And so 
uh, Rob and I got to got to be pretty good friends through just you know cross recruiting and and racing and and all those sorts of things. Um, and so uh, that summer of 2013, while I was overseas uh, with the U23 women's team, uh, I heard about the opening, and uh, it definitely appealed to me. I mean, I, I had been an assistant coach for 16 years, 15 years, and was looking for that opportunity uh, to be a head coach at the Division One level. So, oh, that sounds good. Now. I will tell you that, and I've mentioned this in several of my blog posts and so forth relating to um, the athletic director, Chuck Gladchuck. I think this guy, since he showed up in 20, 2002, has got this crazy good ability to identify coaches who are really good fits for the Naval Academy. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your initial conversations with him and, and what that was like. <laughs> Yeah, I I I, uh, I I tell this story pretty frequently, just to friends and and that sort of thing. Just about how, um, you know, I was up in Princeton coaching with the national team, and and uh, I had none of my belongings with me, so I effectively came to Annapolis in between practices uh, um, to interview, and uh, you know was uh, you know in in a shirt and and slacks, and that's about all I had. I didn't have a suit, um, but. You know that that initial conversation with Chet and and Rob was in the room. Friedrich uh, at the time. Um, you know, it, it, we had the Syracuse connection together, uh, and I think that was that was part of it. Um, and I think he he kind of was looking for someone that um, was was willing to to do kind of the hard work it was going to take to get the the team back to prominence. There was a it was a pretty down year uh, the year before. Uh, I was hired on, and so I think you know he definitely was, um, you know, and and you know Chet. I mean, he's pretty pretty straightforward, and I think he he speaks pretty plainly. So I don't I don't think he made any bones about what what the what the job would entail here, but also kind of what he was looking for in terms of someone that was willing to come in, change the culture, uh, you know, change some of the things that that uh, you know had maybe been falling by the wayside uh, in the couple of years leading up to hiring on myself or whoever was going to be hired. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we connected, uh, you know, had had some good talks about, uh, you know, the winters in Syracuse. So um, from his time <laughs> yeah. being associate AD up there. Uh, so we, we shared that in common. And, and um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think... I think he got a sense that that I was ready, mm -hmm. um, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, that that you know I I had l been lucky enough to learn under a lot of really um, solid coaches and um, and getting that opportunity to uh, you know sit down with him and, and talk about the job. Yeah, that, I totally get that. And one more thing along those lines before we get on to discussing the team in particular. Um, when you think about your coaching philosophy and the types of athletes you knew that you would be coaching, what kind of synergy did you see there that really attracted you to say, hey, yeah, I know what, if, if this offer is made, I'm definitely going to jump on it? Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I, one of the coaches I was coaching uh, with uh, the women's U23 team and, and a friend of mine who is uh, uh, now the president of one of the boat manufacturers here in the, in the United States, um, he's a Coast Guard alum. And both he and the, the person I was coaching with when the Coast Guard Academy job came open, which was maybe my first or second year at, at Syracuse, you know, they were, you know, people identify that in me, I guess, um, those qualities of, of being pretty type A, pretty, um, you know, pretty detail oriented. So I, I think they were like, hey, this would be a perfect fit for you up at Coast Guard. For me, it wasn't the right time. Um, and I felt like there were a few, few more things I'd like to accomplish at Syracuse and, and learn. Um, but when the job came open here, um, you know, I, I think it's important uh, for folks to know kind of what what type of gravity the Naval Academy carries when we're at regattas. I can tell you from from being a coach out on the West Coast and we come out here and race Navy or, you know, even being up at Syracuse and coming down to the yard to race there. There is a mystique to it, you know, and, and when you see. 60 midshipmen detailing boats in their in their you know work uniform or whatever it may be you know it, it's it's impressive mm -hmm. um and so I, I think at the end of the day they're all 18 to 22 year old guys and and we know that you know here at, at the academy but I, I think being an outsider looking in you, you just kind of marvel at at the wow they're squared away they are really you know they there, it's intimidating. I mean, like, and that's, you know, it's just like anything else, football, basketball. I mean, if you're, 
intimidated even before the first whistle blows or you know the kickoff uh like you're already in a good spot as right. a competitor right so, right exactly yeah yeah all right good stuff um so now let's kind of get into the the basics uh of just rowing in general as a sport and i will tell you that I, up until last year, I was essentially a casual fan, right? I mean, I, sure. I knew about, I had friends at the academy when I was there that rode. And during the six months I was out in San Diego learning to fly the helicopter I flew in the fleet, I used to watch the races out on Mission Bay. But until I had a chance to chat in detail with my two classmates, Scott Gordon and Tom Callahan, they're the ones that really got me hooked on, <laughs> on the sport yeah. as, as a, yeah. you know, fanatic, basically. And um, sure. but a lot of people aren't in that spot right now. And there's still a lot that I don't know. So I wanted to just kind of set right. things up for our listeners and talk a little bit about the basics of a general race, either a dual or invitational. How many crews do you typically enter in races like this? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, that going back to the previous question about kind of the, the footprint that Navy puts down, you know, whether it be the, our women's team, our heavyweight team, our lightweight team. Um, we're always fielding the maximum amount of, amount of boats we possibly can uh, at each race. So even if it's just a dual race where, you know, it's a cup race, uh, you know, a perpetual cup that, that's being raced between, let's say, Columbia and, and the Naval Academy, when our team shows up, you know, we're, we're trying to bring five eights worth of athletes. So you're talking 40 to 45 athletes um, on a bus, and that's about what the, the Academy buses will allow us to to take. But unfortunately, I think, you know, especially pandemic wise and, and even before the pandemic, um, you know, we had uh, a lot of teams that were trying to, they're not trying, but, but pairing back their rosters, I think in an effort maybe to, to uh, gosh, I don't know. There's probably a lot of different motivations there, but, uh, but the bottom line is that, you know, Chet and, and the athletic department have been extremely supportive of, of rowing in general for all three programs. So they've just asked that we, you know, if we're taking boats out and we're, we're traveling the maximum amount of, of athletes we can, uh, that it's, that they're all going out there to win. And it's not just kind of guys on the side or half in half out. So I guess to get to your question, if we show up to a race, you know, ideally our competitors, uh, you know, have five eights to race. If they don't, we'll race, um, you know, usually every team is going to have at least a, a first varsity through a third varsity, so three eights worth of athletes. Um, beyond that, mm -hmm. if if they only have a, a third eight, we'll put our fourth varsity in with the third varsity race, uh, so it becomes three lanes of racing as opposed to two. Um, mm -hmm. So we're just trying to give the midshipmen as many opportunities to race uh, before our conference and national championships as we can. Um, but yeah, and that, and you know, the format, you essentially, you, you normally work backwards in a schedule so that your last race is your cup race is your first varsity eight. Um, and that's usually the, the, the boat that's racing for, uh, that perpetual cup each year. Right. Right. Now, um, let's talk distances. Okay. And, 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 and rowing, we have a fall season and a spring season, correct? Correct. Correct. Now in the spring, the distance is 2000 meters, but in the fall, it's a little bit longer. So I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So I, you know, there's a, um, <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of ways to unpack that. Um, I, I think, you know, way, way back, you know, the, the men's national championship, uh, the IRA regatta, which it still is under the same namesake, but, um, you know, when it was being contested on the Poughkeepsie river, um, you know, those were much longer distance races than we do now in the spring for 2000 meters. Now, the, the international and the Olympic level and, you know, otherwise is all 2000 meters. So a mile and a quarter in the spring. And so that's, that's what everyone is training towards is that mm -hmm. distance. Um, I, I guess, you know, for, for a casual, um, you know, kind of lay person as far as rowing goes, what, what could I equate our fall season to? It's like, it's, you know, it's baseball, fall ball. Got it. Um, it's the opportunity to go out. We train. I don't think that, you know, from a training standpoint, we're necessarily tapering or we're trying to really focus in and, and, you know, it's a really point, you know, or a huge point of, of our season, but, uh, it does break up the training and it does allow our guys to go out and, and test themselves against our competitors, uh, that we'll see in the spring, if that makes sense. So. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. All right. Tell you what, we're going to step away for a short break. And when we return, we'll continue our conversation with coach Sean Bagnall. We'll be right back.
Okay, thanks for staying with us, everyone. Carl Darden here, along with Navy lightweight rowing coach Sean Bagnall. Coach, now I want to talk a little bit about team selection. So here's the thing that I'm very curious about, and I, the timing of this could be pretty good because even though this is, like you are saying, a, a fall ball type of environment, the approach is still the same. Yeah. Um, say you got an invitational or a dual meet or something coming up like in two weeks, right. okay? Uh, I'm curious to know about that whole process that goes into selecting the, the crew for each boat. Uh, what, what type of workouts do you do? Uh, and tell me a little bit about any kind of technology that you use to kind of measure performance, or is it mostly an, like an eyeball test or whatever, you know, all that kind of stuff that goes into selecting the, 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 the rowers that are going to compete. Yeah. Um, right. Because, you know, we do field all three teams here, probably field larger teams. I mean, we're not able to actually go out and race all 60 athletes that are on our team. So we do have to do some selection. Um, it, it certainly is, is, is the, you know, indoor testing, um, you know, on their ergometers, uh, just physiologically at a baseline, like where our guys at, we, we may or may not do some weight adjustment to those, those scores as well, uh, just to see kind of pound for pound where guys are stacking up. But, um, in terms of selection, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to a place where, you know, if we're two weeks out from our first cup race against Princeton, um, you know, we'll, we'll be doing a large amount of, um, time trialing and effectively um, side by side racing with kind of even or mixed boats, and then we're we're usually exchanging one or maybe two athletes. Um, kind of to your point, looking for combinations, um, but also looking for kind of just squeezing as much talent into one boat as we possibly can. Um, and and it's not a lot of you know, I, I know there is technology out there that, that, uh, you can hardwire a boat for power curves and the pressure on the foot stretchers, which are the, you know, oh, wow. you're, what you're pushing <laughs> against. And I, I mean, as an example, there's when this, uh, it's a European company that, that essentially sells some of this technology and, and the Princeton coaches at the heavyweight level, um, you know, bought into it. And I don't know how many years ago this was, you know, but they had to literally hire a consultant to come in and analyze all the data because they were getting oh. so much, <laughs> so much data from what, you know, one practice that, uh, you know, there certainly are things you can do to try to match up power on the water in terms of how they're applying their power and, and different things. But I think the fun part of what we do is that it's not, it's not all science and it, it, it can't right. be, it can't be all boiled down to, to numbers. It, it really is, some some art to it which is is fun um and i and i do think that 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 kind of going back to the previous question too about fall racing you know that's another thing too you may see something that really is clicking in the fall and you make a note of it in your journal and then mm -hmm. you get to march and you're like hey you know i remember this really really worked well in the fall and so you start trying things out but um yeah so i i would say it's kind of this this mix of on the water testing, but certainly uh, we tell our, our oarsmen that their, their erg score, you know, their ergometer for 2,000 meters or 5,000 meters or 500 meters, I mean, that's your resume. And that resume gets you the seat race, which is the interview out on the water. And, you know, if you, if you win, you know, if you do well in your interview, you get the job. So then you're in the boat. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Okay, so coach, the next question I had for you, and, and I'm thinking about what goes into, I mean, based on my novice uh, level of experience. When I think about what goes into uh, a solid crew, I'm coming up with like three characteristics. One is basic team chemistry within the boat. Another one obviously is physical strength. And then the third one is strong rowing technique. Okay. And I'm wondering if there's a way to force rank these things, <laughs> which ones, <laughs> are, which, how would you do that? Or, or are they all equal? And, and, and if they are equal, that's fine. And, and just explain to me your rationale. Yeah, you know what? I gosh, I you know, the the meathead in me wants to say, you know, it's kind of power is the great, you know, differentiator, right? Um it's difficult to win races if you know you show up to the starting line and you're on an average 10 or 20 seconds slower than your competition. For me, I would say like just sheer physical raw power and talent um from a physiology standpoint would probably be one mm -hmm. And then I would say the other two are probably, you know, two A and two B. Um, you know, because you, you can have crews that, that row really well, but you know, I, I think about some of the crews even I rode in in college. You know, I didn't like 
everybody in the mm-hmm. boat. But, <laughs> you know, we weren't all super fast friends. But, you know, at the same time, once you lined up, everybody had a common purpose for at least 2,000 meters. So, um, yeah, so I, I, would, I would go 1 and then 2A, 2B. So, yeah. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Uh, so, Coach, now let's look back at the IRA championships. Uh, the team had a pretty strong spring. Um, what were your expectations going in? I, obviously, the, the spring was a little bit disrupted because of COVID, but uh, what were your expectations going in to the IRAs, and, and how did those final results um, square with those expectations? Yeah, um, I, I think our expectations as a coaching staff, myself and, and James Sands, my assistant coach, I, we really were kind of, you know, throughout the season – you know, it, until we got to probably mid to late April where we knew, you know, everybody was kind of coming around just about getting second dose of vaccine and being vaccinated where we knew there wouldn't be any massive hiccups. Um, our expectation was, you know, hey, we're going to go out and, and we're going to take a lot of joy in just getting mm-hmm. the opportunity to compete. Uh, because we, we did know and there were, you know, a good handful of teams, you know, across the country and even in our league and the lightweight league that didn't, didn't make it to the national championships for whatever reason or another uh, related to the, to the uh, pandemic. So um, really, uh, you know, our expectation was let, let's, let's put together the fastest lineups possible. We had some cross recruiting result or cross um, racing results with, um, you know, Penn and Princeton. So we knew and Temple and Mercier. So, I mean, the the competitor, we had a good idea. Like we, we knew we were in the ballpark um, and it would be tight racing, you know, at the IRA. Uh, So I, I I think we just wanted our guys to go out there, you know, when they started kind of hitting the the pain cave part of the race, (laughs) just really take some joy in the fact you get the opportunity to do that. And, uh, um, and that was, that was it. It wasn't, you know, this wasn't a full charge type of season season where we were, you know, we, we knew kind of what was happening around the corner cause we didn't. And that was, you know, kind of take one day at a time, control the controllables is where we were at. So. Right. Okay. Now I wanted to get into the races a little bit more. Um, I did watch them a few times right after the championships and in both the fours and the second varsity eight races, uh, both crews won by a pretty comfortable margin. It was the final race with the first Varsity 8 boat that was the closest. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that one in terms of how the race progressed by 500 meter increments based on your recollection, okay? Because I remember, I, I can't remember, if it was, was it the Penn boat or the Princeton boat was making a push on them and closed it within about, uh, I'm going to say, three quarters of a boat length. Yeah, uh, that was the, the, the Penn boat, yeah. Right, right. So kind of walk me through that and and talk about, okay, how did your team respond and when did you know, okay, we, we got this now we've, we've, we've met that challenge and we're, we're going to make it to the finish line first. Yeah. Um, you know, so a, as you pointed out, I, I think those first, you know, the, the, the fours race, you know, and again, my, my hat goes off to, to James, my assistant. I mean, he's, he, whether it's been the coxed four or the, the four without a coxswain, um, those boats have been doing fantastic the last few years. And, and I think that's a, uh, you know, Certainly a nod to him and certainly a nod to the depth of the program, um, being able to field those boats and have them do well. So when that boat came out and kind of charged out with, uh, you know, the pretty young crew, I think it was three freshmen and, or three plebes and one, one second class guy, uh, stroking the boat. Um, you know, we were, you know, like, okay, well, that's great. That's a good result. You know, the two V race, you know, a little bit like the one V where, you know, everybody kind of shot out. Um, I think we we knew we would get everybody's best, uh, you know, best effort there and best shot in that first 500 to 750 meters of the race. Um, And then, um, you know, and and those guys were able to kind of pull out and pull away. And that was that was great. But that third race, you're right. I mean, uh, (laughs) like, again, we we had some cross uh, racing results. We knew we were in the the wheelhouse of where Penn and, and Princeton had been with some of our cross results. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, knowing coach Farrell up at, up at Penn, like I, there was uh, not until we got into that last right, 15 strokes where I knew we had enough real estate to where, you know, it would take something, uh, some massive boat stopping event for us or something kind of otherworldly for them. Um, you know, did, did I actually <laughs> take, take a breath and, um, you know, say, say a little prayer and, and, you know, we got it done. 
but yeah, it was, and, and, and that's the great thing about our league, um, just on the lightweight side, is that uh, given that everybody's in the same weight range and, and a lot, you know, a lot of the same erg scores, and, and so it's, it really just comes down to the athletes and putting those combinations together and, and the effort they're able to go out and put out, so um if the question is when you know when did i think it was a, a done deal you know again 10 15 strokes before the end maybe where i i knew we had enough you know and and as long as nothing catastrophic happened we'd be all right mm-hmm. okay good so let's kind of talk about those athletes a little bit because i remember and i can't i can't remember if i read it i, I think it was on the on the uh navy sports website where in your post meet comments, you were referencing your athletes who had never rode before. Okay. And the contributions right. that they had made to, to the team overall, either as part of the boats that competed and, and maybe you can kind of refresh my memory on those and how many freshmen we had, you know, sitting, uh, in those right. races or just as part of the team that helped push them to, to perform at the level that they did. So I was wondering if you could give us some insight on the types of things you look for in athletes who've never held an oar in their hands that would lead you to think that you might have a potential national champion or national team member there? Um, boy, I, you know, I, I think each year it's, you know, so, you know, we, we had our last plebe intramural yesterday um, here at the boathouse, so now they're heading off for reform. Um, but as we say to the plebes to kind of entice them to come show up on, on Monday, the first day of the academic year, for us, it's, it's like Christmas, you know, we, every year we get a new package in front of us and as, you know, wrapping paper, <laughs> and we get to unwrap it on the first day and see, you know, kind of see what the team's going to look like. And it's always exciting. It's literally probably one of the, you know, two, three, four things that has kept me, kept me in the sport is just each year, you know, you have this renewed sense of like, Hey, this is, this is going to be awesome. So, um, the, the guys that show up throughout the summer, it's, it's very, you know, basic here at the boathouse. Uh, I like to say it's like making sausage. You know, it's just a lot of real, real basics. And you're trying to take guys that have come from a baseball track, swimming, you know, water polo background and try to get them to figure out how to apply their athleticism to the, to the sport of rowing. But going back to your question about, um, you know, what attracted me to the job. I was a former walk-on. My brother rode in high school in Seattle, but, uh, you know, I was football and ba- basketball. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously too short and slow to do those <laughs> things at the Division One level. So, you know, so I walked on, and I think that was a huge part of what enticed me to the job at Navy was that, like, you, you get the opportunity to work with these guys that, that are tremendous athletes. Clearly, you know, they have an athletic background coming to the academy, but then, then they get this kind of renewed um, uh, purpose or, or, or outlet for their, for their athletic ability. And, and um, you, know, you know, our last Olympian here at the Boathouse was, was Ed, Ed Mix King, who, uh, class of 2011, rode in the Rio Olympics. Um, you know, Ed never rode before he got to the mm-hmm. academy, rode in the lightweight four in Rio, um, was on the national team for quite a few years after his graduation, but, or his commissioning. But, you know, I mean, bottom line is, you know, we, you know, we look for guys that have a tenacity to what they're doing that, that want to, I mean, sure, there's physical traits that, that are important, um, you know, just in terms of leverage and, and, you know, kind of making the most of each stroke. But at the same time, just finding guys that, that really do enjoy the grind. They enjoy being out on the Severin in 30 degree <laughs> weather and, you know, it's, it's raining and it's windy and choppy and, it's not, you know, I'm sure people would rather be in West B running around the track, but, uh, you know, the, these guys are, these guys are out on the water and, and just finding that mentality that, that, you know, they, they love to push themselves to kind of another level. And, um, you know, I think we saw some of that in, in those boats that, that did race at the national championships. So it was about 50% almost, uh, of, of recruited athletes, uh, that had rode in high school and walk on athletes that had never rode before the academy. That tradition of walk on rowing and, and, um, you know, obviously we, we at the lightweight side have had a tremendous amount of success with that. Rob has had, uh, on the heavyweight side, multiple U23 athletes, um, that have never rode before the academy. And then even our women's team, uh, there was a woman in the U23 eight this summer. Uh, who walked on, never had rode before from Corvallis, Oregon. Oh, yeah. Alexandria Valencia Martinson. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I would love to get a chance to talk with her sometime. <laughs> Man, 
she's bad. Like she is, <laughs> she is tough. Like, you know, like, and it's funny cause we showed these, uh, you know, we, we showed the plebes, the U23 videos as, as, uh, you know, we, we had a day or two with thunderstorms. We couldn't be out. So, um, that, they, they were, you know, impressed when they saw her standing there, like, yeah, <laughs> she is legit. So, um, and even to the point where, I, you know, the national team coaches have been talking to her for a while. You know, it'd be great to see her have the ability, you know, in, in some form or fashion with her service selection, be able to continue to train. Because I, I think she has the talent to right. do some some good things uh, yeah. for the U.S. national right. team. So, Okay, so let's yeah. go ahead and kind of jump to this team. And I know that we're still kind of... We're still kind of early, so most of your information is going to be drawn from the, the athletes you have coming back, right? Uh, what are your expectations for this year's team? And you certainly have that this whole fall season to kind of prepare. And then, of course, things really kind of get going in the spring when you look to defend your title. So how does this team look to you going into the fall based on what you know now? Yeah, no, great, great question. Like I said, it's a little, little like Christmas. We'll, we'll see what the package is like. I, I joke that it's either going to be a, a puppy dog and we're all going to be really happy or it'll be, you know, socks and underwear. <laughs> like we'll be like, you know, okay. You know, not, not the, not the greatest Christmas gift, but, um, but, you know, I, I think, uh, James, um, really spearheaded a, a solid recruiting effort last year, even, even with COVID. We did a lot of, uh, obviously, like every coach was doing some recruiting, you know, via Zoom and Google Meet and, and incorporating as much of the academy into our, our, you know, into our presentations with these recruits as we could. Uh, we are extremely excited about the plebe athletes and obviously they have a, a lot of things to navigate outside of the boathouse. So, you know, we, we really do focus on allowing them to kind of figure out how to be a, a good midshipman. And then, you know, like, let's worry about the, the rowing. Um, but on paper, the, the talent of the plebe class is, is right up there with some of the best that I've had in, in the nine years I've been here in terms of our recruits. Um, the returners, I mean, we're returning everyone, uh, from the, the national championship group. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, the, the group that traveled. So I, I, I think, you know, expectations are, you know, we're not putting an asterisk on last year, no apologies. Like we're going to come out and, and try to do everything we possibly can to repeat. Um, and I think that's the expectation mm -hmm. each year is that, you know, not only are we, are, are we trying to get into that last 500 meters, the last minute of the race or so with an opportunity to win, win a national championship, but then make sure that on the back end, our guys are commissioning with their top choice. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to repeat again this year with the Dean's award. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and just kind of continue to, to, you know, and, and Chet says it in our meetings in the athletic department, just about kind of being successful in all phases of everything they're doing here. Um, again, we know that there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things to come between now and, and May 2022. But um, I think last year was was massively educational for our team in terms of, you know, what can I control today, right now, in my performance, in my staying healthy. So, um, yeah, so I mean, you know, the expectation is I think the guys are it's a good thing when you when you're coming off a great year. I, I think that creates and, and kind of interjects and um, you know, puts that, that purpose into, um, you know, the upper class. And, and I think they're going to draw the, the plebes right along with them. So. Okay. So based on what you just told me, would you characterize that as one of the team's strengths, this experience that they had from last year and the ability to draw, draw from that and pull the, uh, pull the incoming freshman team with them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would, I would say it is a strength. I, you know, I, I think, I don't know. It's, I try to find different analogies and, and James and I have talked about that. Um, just, you know, my experience was on the heavyweight side, um, as a heavyweight mm -hmm. assistant coach or freshman coach was that, you know, the more guys you had reaching a certain level on the indoor rowing machine, it becomes less of a kind of mystique. Oh, can they break six minutes? And it becomes more like a, a kind of normalcy of it. Like, Oh, well, that's what we do. We just break six minutes. Um, you know, I think at the same time, you know, like having guys understand that they can row well enough and they can put in the, the proper amount of preparation and effort um, and that at the end of the day that can equate to a, a national championship. I think, you know, having that that knowledge, um, I, I do think, you know, informs them about, OK, well, what do we need to do right off the bat? And, and again, I, I think we're 
hopefully knock on wood in a better spot than we were when we started the school year last year, um, you know, because it was definitely a slow roll. Um, and we missed a lot, a lot of training um, just with kind of COVID pauses and those sorts of things. But um, having that knowledge of the year before and kind of what what they know they need to do, um, you know, I think is helpful. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Um, OK, I tell you what, we're going to go ahead and take a short break now, but stay with us and uh, we'll be back shortly with our next segment. Okay, welcome back to Navy Sports Central. Carl Darden here with you, and we are joined by Sean Bagnall, who is the head coach of the defending national champion Navy lightweight rowing team. Uh, coach, we're going to get into our lightning round segment here in a minute, but before we do that, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about any organizations you're involved with that play a role in promoting rowing across the country, or you can even talk about the Navy program in general and uh, you know, talk about some reasons why some high school athletes may want to consider coming to Navy to row. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, in terms of organizations, you know, we, we, um, there's not, not a ton outside of, you know, the academy that, that we have. I mean, there's a couple of coaching associations, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, certainly for, for junior rowers or, or people that are looking to get into the sport, um, at the high school level, you know, U.S. rowing, who's our, you know, governing body is a pretty solid resource, uh, to, to get after. Um, for, for athletes that are looking at the academy, I mean, we are constantly, and as I, you know, kind of, um, alluded to or, or spoke to, uh, previously just about the ability for, uh, us to work with athletes that maybe don't row right now and are, you know, outstanding athletes winning state championships in their respective sports across the country. Um, that experience can play well into, into becoming a division one rower. Um, so, you know, we, we just look for athletes that, that are interested, um, you know, obviously reaching out to, to the coaching staff via the, um, online questionnaires with Navy sports or, um, yeah, I guess the Navy sports site, uh, here, here with the Academy. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, other than look, you know, you can follow the team, you know, on, on Instagram and it's just Navy lightweight rowing, um, is the handle. But, um, you know, other than that, if you're ever in Annapolis, come out to the boathouse. It's a great spot to, to check out. So. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so now we're going to get into, you know, a segment that I started, I guess it was about two or three months ago, and it turned out to be pretty fun, so I decided to kind of continue it. Um, we're, I'm just going to ask you a series of questions here, and just nice, quick, rapid answer. Any kind of answer that uh, begs a follow-up question, I will definitely ask that. Um, so these, always, these are always pretty funny. So here we go. Um, so first one, most exciting race you've been a part of both as a coach and when you were competing? Mm. Uh, I would say most exciting as a coach. Ooh, ah, man, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, but I, I think as a, as a Naval Academy coach, it would have been my first year and we hosted Harvard. Um, you know, we were coming off a pretty down year the year before. I don't think Harvard expected us to be anywhere near them. And it came down to the last three strokes on the Severn and, um, it was exciting. We didn't, we didn't win, but it was a beep beep kind of finish and, uh, and, you know, super exciting as, as a, as an athlete, uh, we had a great rivalry my freshman year with Stanford. Um, you know, I had, I was rowing for a club team, but we, we managed to have a pretty, pretty solid, uh, top, top freshman eight. So, um, they weren't the nicest guys on the water or off the water at the San Diego Crew Classic when we saw them there. And, and so when we got a chance to race them again at, at Pac 10s, uh, for the conference, you know, championships, uh, yeah, that was an exciting race. You know, being able to, to go out and kind of command the race all the way down, I think, uh, it was, it was, it was fun there in Redwood, Redwood Shores. Yeah. So. All right. Good. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, toughest conditions you've ever competed in. Me personally, or as a as a coach? Well, we'll go with both. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, uh, boy, me personally, I, I don't know. I, I, they all kind of blend into rowing in white caps at some point. Um, but right. I, I would say for our guys, it would have been uh, 2019. Uh, our race here on the Severn against Penn, we ended up canceling a couple lower boat races and getting the the first and second varsity races in. But you know, we were 
working with the Coast Guard who was helping helping kind of manage things out on the water and they were even a little iffy as to whether we should be out there but you know we got the races in and it was safe and all that but it uh uh-huh. it was it was a little touch and go my wife was was out in the launch you know kind of wondering why were we out here <laughs> so, uh, but the guys the guys you know they were glad we got it in so um so that that brings me to mind another quick question as it relates to the conditions uh headwind or crosswind which is tougher to deal with Ooh, uh i would say cross yeah crosswind uh, that's yeah and and, it, and if you think of a six lane buoyed course you know if there's six lanes anything you saw in the olympics um you know in tokyo there even just the last month um with that crosswind there's going to be favorable lanes and there's going to be unfavorable so you know depending on how your seating goes or how your racing went in the heats or the preliminary races or whatever you could end up, it could be a long day. Um, and it could be a long day in a headwind, but at least that's kind of affecting the field equally. Um, you know, cause all six lanes are affected the same way that way. So, okay. Best innovation to come along in the last 20 years with respect to equipment, um, training methods, anything like that. Huh? Uh, 20 years. Uh, I can tell you in, in the, you know, whatever 20, if you wanted to stretch that out to like 20, 25, sure. 30 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, when I, when I was rowing, when I first started rowing, um, we went from in even, yeah, I know the, the video behind me won't show up on this, but the, you know, uh, the, the Macon or the spoon blades, which are yeah. kind of the skinnier, uh-huh. smaller blades. And then they, they move to a, a larger kind of hatchet blade. Um, and that was, that was pretty, pretty revolutionary when you saw, you know, crews and, and, you know, kind of how that affected the speed of boats and that sort of thing. Um, it was pretty, pretty substantial. So. Okay, good. Uh, next question. Most unlikely finish by the mids in a race since you've been coaching them. Yeah, uh, I would say that would have to be uh, 2019, and that that actually did that that race uh, with for our first varsity eight at the Eastern Sprints. Uh, we hadn't medaled in that race uh, in the varsity eight since I think 2009 or 11, somewhere in there. So it had been a long time, um, and so. We had gone in uh, ranked seventh just based on our kind of regular season results. Uh, we ended up finishing third behind Penn and Yale. Um, and that was, you know, extremely close, you know, kind of beep, beep, beep for first, second, third. So, um, but I think coming out, our guys, no one really expecting us to, to be in that position and uh, just kind of the, the mm-hmm. grit, the teeth and tenacity of that group to go out and finish third. It actually ended up... Um, you know, we ended up getting nominated and and, and uh, voted for the Rusty Cowell Award, which is kind of a, a, a substantial award in our our league amongst the heavy and lightweight uh, teams. So, um, yeah, that that group in 2019 and that that varsity race. All sure. right. Okay. So this one kind of goes towards rowing and rowing popularity and maybe trying to figure out ways to to attract more fans. Uh, name one change you would make to either the rules or introducing some sort of concept that would be even more entertaining. I mean, I, I, I love watching these races. I mean, they're very suspenseful and everything like that, but, um, yeah. anything along those lines that you might do differently if you, if you're like the commissioner for like a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you know, it's funny cause we, we always talk to people about how our sport, like once, once you kind of push them off the dock, there's no halftime, there's no taking a timeout. You can't make adjustments on the fly. It really is in the hands of the athletes and the coxswain in the, in the coxswain seat, um, to, to make sure that they're going out and doing kind of what they've rehearsed, uh, you know, the week or the two weeks or months beforehand. Um, so, you know, it would be funny to kind of have a, a format where you would have a, a pause or a timeout or some way to make an adjustment. Obviously, that's I, I would never advocate for that because I think it would take away from from what we do. But um, but I've always thought that would be kind of comical. But, uh, you know, something that that I feel like uh, the Newhouse uh, School of Communications is doing well up at up at Syracuse um, and only know them because I used to, you know, coach there and recruit there. But they, they really have kind of gone whole hog on on working with ESPN and, and drones and, you know, something like the drone coverage for the Royal Henley Regatta. Um, that was awesome. Over in England. Yeah. And, and so 
you know, when the, when the team's racing the King's Cup, um, you know, the, the, the eight from the Naval Academy here back in the summer of 2019, um, or, you know, even our races now, the, the more, I guess, the more coverage and not necessarily, you know, do we need to be on the big ESPN, but, um, I figure if they can have the cornhole championships on, on, <laughs> on ESPN three, they can probably make a slot there for, for rowing. So, um, <laughs> right, right. you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just, we're, we're, you know, anything we can do to promote the sport. And I think it's great when you have companies that are out there, um, that are creating new opportunities for people to row in the gyms or at their house or, you know, and then just even kind of opening those, those doors of opportunity. And that's something that's, that's really happened lately, um, in the last year, just opportunities, right. whether that be for, uh, inner city or, or underserved communities in the, in the rowing communities or cities that, that have rowing or, you know, even just people that live in the middle of nowhere and, and don't have access to it, figuring out how to do that through the internet or through their own indoor rowing bit. So, um, I know that's not, that's a tangent and not really answering your question there, but, um, no, that's, that's fine. Yeah. I would say, I would, I would say the more, the more cameras and coverage and, you know, that would, that would be great. Yeah. yeah I, I totally agree with you there because that definitely creates a lot more engagement yes. and that, that, you know, that God view from the top using yeah. the drone. I mean, that is awesome. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's, that's kind of that normal complaint of, of whether it be parents, you know, they're trying to watch a you know, my mom and, and stepdad used to go out and watch my, my younger brother go race in Seattle. And it's like, yeah, we get to see him for like 20 seconds, but we're at the, we're at the regatta for four right, hours right. and you get to see this little 20 second as they roll by <laughs> and they're so far away. You don't know where, where they're at or who, which boat is theirs. And, and it, yeah. So the more, <laughs> right. the more fan friendly we can make it, I think the better. For sure. For sure. Okay. Um, the type of workout that is least popular with the team, but you just got to do it for the, for the strong foundation. I mean, the one they really, really hate. <laughs> yeah. So you know, we, we kind of ran into this, uh, with, with their least favorite workout. We do a progression over the course of, you know, six, seven weeks where we're, we're kind of adding a lot, you know, it's a very intense set of, of, um, indoor rowing machine, like erg workouts. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's extremely high intensity. It's, it's pushing yourself. You get a small break, push yourself again. Um, and, and, you know, we call it a VO2 progression, but essentially we got four, three or four weeks into that. And then the superintendent had to kind of pause things for COVID between kind of mid February and mid March. Um, and we went back and, and restarted it and, um, I almost had a mutiny, but <laughs> I, I think, I think they, they understood at the end that we, we did it, you know, did it for the right reasons and it wasn't just, uh, you know, but yeah, th that, those are the, those are the sessions and, we call them our third deck sessions here at the at the boathouse, just because we do it all up on the third deck uh -huh. on the indoor rowing machines, and and uh, yeah, um, puking is is common, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right, like yeah, the guy's not feeling great after those workouts, so yeah, that'd probably be their least least favorite. So, okay, funniest thing you've ever witnessed at a race, either as a coach or a competitor? Mm. Yeah, oh man, I. I I, it'd be tough for me to, to, to try to recollect one uh, over a bunch, but, uh, the, the crews, you know, kind of racing into, and it's, uh, you know, I've seen it multiple times where you're having a leisurely race and, uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden there's a flock of geese that decide to land right in front of the boat or, <laughs> you know, uh, that sort of thing. I, I can tell you as a competitor, my, the one that makes me smile every time I think about it at, at Redwood Shores and, and that's kind of the Stanford, um, home course in, in, uh, just not in Palo Alto, but, um, it's just off of one on one, um, and and in that it's a it's truly a dual format. There's only enough room really for there's two lanes, so it's just two boats at a time, and the starting line is is kind of in this little inlet that's kind of on the south end of the bay there, and and uh, uh, you know it has a has a rope that the six seat the six person in the you know three back from the the stroke seat. Um, is holding on to a rope and they align the boats, the bow balls, you know, holding on to that. So, um, my freshman year, the guy sitting six seat and Jesse, I'll send this along to you. Uh, he, uh, he was holding it and they used to do a different starting command than they do now where they actually would say essentially ready, set, go. Uh, and it wasn't in those words, but it would be ready, set, go. 
and they've they've since removed the set. Now it's just the tension go. But the the thing was that you were supposed to let go mm-hmm. of the rope, and on set every team tried to get a little bit of an extra squeeze or a little bit of a you know try to anticipate the the starter saying go. Um, so essentially, we we squeezed on set and we just drifted away from the starting line, and the official said nothing. And the, I can't remember who the other team was that we were racing said nothing. We were just drifting away. And, and, you know, the official was, was laughing, you know, and, and called us back to the line. And, and we didn't really, I mean, it was comically sm- slow moving away from the starting <laughs> line. And he said, look, I, you know, I, I won't call that a false start. I'll call it a premature squeeze. So, and that was, that, that was pretty funny just because I think everybody was like, what are they doing? And we're just mo- moving, just drifting away. You know? <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. The biggest difference you see between coaching the athletes at Navy and the ones you previously coached at Syracuse. Yeah. And, and I think for your listeners, I, I don't think it'll come as a surprise. Um, you know, the answer here, and that's that, um, you know, with whether it be the guys I coached at Syracuse or, or you know, the guys and gals at Syracuse, guys and gals at Gonzaga, Washington State, um, the the purpose at the boathouse is always the same. And, and you know, the, there, there was no, you know, in my mind, there's not a ton of difference between a civilian school in that way or, or the Naval Academy. I think I think it really is, and again, no surprise that that once they step out of the boathouse, that there is this this like common purpose. You know, there is this kind of common uniting bond to the mids and and to the athletes when they leave the boathouse. I mean, clearly they're all going to be great friends, and everybody's the best man in each other's weddings, and and all those sorts of things. But um, I think the difference just being that, you know, when, when our guys, uh, leave the boathouse, it isn't, uh, you know, like, Hey, I'm going to go off and go work on trying to get myself to wall street or do X, Y, Z, wherever, you know, they, they really, you know, they, they leave and then they, they buddy up and start talking about kind of what they're, what they're learning in their classes or what Marine is going to be speaking to them that Mm -hmm. night or whatever. And it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, it, it really is, they have this united, purpose here at the boathouse and then they leave and they have this united purpose as a as you know each other's company mates or or otherwise when they leave right so, right um yeah and again no no surprise there really. yeah okay all right very good okay so that kind of wraps things up for us um coach i tell you this has been a great conversation i really appreciate you joining us um before we go is there anything else i may have left out that you want to throw in there uh before we wrap things up you know uh, Carl, just thank you so much for the platform, and I and I mentioned this to our our SID and in, in the uh, in the athletic department, but um, just having the opportunity uh, to brag on our guys a little bit um, is always you know is always great. I, I know we're not always necessarily um, kind of the top premier sport at the academy, but I mean our guys you know on the team and and the athletes that show up here at the boathouse certainly treat it that way and and. Uh, and there's no doubt, you know, we have a tremendous amount of respect for the other 32 sports here at the academy um, and what they do. Uh, and we just we just love being able to, to get out in front and, and talk to people that will want to know a little bit more about what happens in, in the boathouse that they drive by each time they come through gate eight. Right, so, right. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're not just the the neat boats that are out there going underneath the academy bridge. They, they, have, <laughs> right. they have the ability to get a little insight into that. So. Um, yeah, any opportunity and I just can't thank you enough for it. So thank you. Okay. Well, I appreciate you being on with us and, uh, I'm looking forward. Actually, I'm going to be coming out to Annapolis in, uh, in October. So maybe I'll hit you up with a quick text or something like that and we can touch base. Love to have you out. Please come out and watch practice. That'd be great. All right. You take care, coach. Thanks a lot. All right. You too, Carl. Okay. So we are in the home stretch now and, uh, tell you what, we're going to go ahead and take a short break and, uh, we'll be right back to wrap things up. All right, we are back to close out this episode with our question of the day. Uh, Before I get to it, I wanted to pass along some of the responses from last episode's question. So you'll recall that we were discussing the women's cross country team with our guest Ginger Rice, and I'd ask this question. Between the marathon, half marathon, and 10K, which race ranks as your most favorite? 
And we got quite a few responders, and I have to say that I was a little surprised with the results. Uh, there are 11 of you who came back with uh, the marathon being your favorite race. So thanks to Scott Wozner, uh, Benjamin Bricko, Paul Barr, Michael Chase, Bob Cooper, Brad Williams, Brian Butler, Jeremiah McInerney, Danny Moore, Greg Shore, and Christina Walker for participating in the poll. And by the way, a quick shout out to Jeremiah McInerney as well. He's from the class of 82, and we first met in the old Marine Corps Marathon chat group prior to the 2007 race. Moving on to the half marathon, there were three responders that listed it as their favorite, and that would be uh, Scott Evans, Dick Wilcox, and Mike Clark. I will say that although completing the marathon in less than four hours was very satisfying to me, my favorite race when running those distances was easily the half marathon. It was long enough to be a challenge, but not so long that it ground you down to nothing by the time you cross the finish line. And finally, we had four people come back with the 10K as being their favorite. Our guest, Ginger Rice, was one of them. Uh, T.D. Smyers, who's also a classmate that also ran track at Navy. It was the second one. Uh, Trisha Perry and Benjamin Bricko again. I, I guess uh, it was a toss-up with him between the 10K and the marathon. So thanks to all of you who responded. I really appreciate it. And now it's time for our question of the day for this episode. Uh, as you might guess, it's related to rowing. Uh, so here it is. What are your thoughts on rowing machines compared to other kinds of indoor cardiovascular fitness equipment? And you got three choices here. Uh, first one is, I think they're great. I use them on a regular basis. Choice number two, it's not my go-to machine, but I'll jump on one as a change of pace if it's available. And finally, choice number three, I'd rather jump headfirst off the Empire State Building onto a thumbtack. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and post this question in the Navy Sports Nation Facebook group page, and you can answer it there. That's going to be our primary way to answer all of our questions of the day moving forward. So I'm looking forward to reading your responses to this one. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Navy Sports Central. Thank you all so much for joining us. Now, if you like what you've heard, remember to follow us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to spread the word to all the other Navy fans out there. I'd also like to thank our guest, Sean Bagnall, the coach of the national champion Navy lightweight rowing team for joining us today. And remember, you can respond to our question of the day by going to the Navy Sports Nation group Facebook page. Uh, I'll go ahead and pin it to the top so you won't miss it. And just a quick reminder, the views expressed on Navy Sports Central are my own and do not reflect those of the U.S. Naval Academy or Navy Athletics. By the way, the music used on Navy Sports Central podcast comes to you from Audio Jungle. This is a great resource for purchasing the rights to use music from thousands of artists around the world, and those we feature in our podcast will be credited in our show notes. Talk to you soon, everybody. Until next time, this is Carl Darden. Go Navy, beat Army.